Good afternoon, everyone. Um, let's see, actually, before we start, I want to talk really quickly. Um, of course, logistics stuff. So homework three has been posted. Um, so same timeline, that'll be due midnight next Wednesday. Um, I received all of the uh, proposals. So I'm going through those and I'll be able to provide some uh, detailed feedback to you, hopefully within the next couple of days uh, so that you guys can really get started with the project. Um, the homeworks one and two have been graded. Uh, and so you should have received uh, those by message in, in Canvas. Um, the homework one solutions are also posted in Canvas and then for homework two, um, they're on the, the, the guide. So the, the final score is the, is the score that's under the normalized part. So that's, um, that's, that's the curved grade. A um, lot of variance in homework two. Uh, but actually, you guys did pretty well um, compared to uh, so the, the same sort of assignment in, in years past. Um, but it is definitely a pretty interesting assignment. There are, there are for example, uh, folks who got um, the same uh, an actual number right, but had a, almost uh, double the difference in scores because of the, the way the risks factors were, were taken into account. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll show some stats on that later. Um, okay, any questions about any of the homeworks or any of the projects? No, okay, well, if you do have any questions about it, definitely feel free to reach out. Um, one thing that I did want to mention, um, oops, let me see. Um, so I didn't talk about this before, but in upcoming homeworks, uh, do please take a note of significant digits. Um, so, can anyone tell me what the difference is between these three numbers here? 7%, 7%, and 7%? That's your level of confidence. Yeah, that's, that's right. So generally, the way that I, um, you, you can roughly think about this uh, as sort of, based on the display, sort of plus or minus 1%, plus or minus, you know, 0.1%, and plus or minus 0.01%. And, and so these, these really mean very sort of different things, right? Um, the, the confidence that, that you provide in your answer, um, in, in any sort of solution uh, is indicated by sort of the number of significant digits. And so, you know, if I, if I have some kind of uh, equation uh, that leads to, you know, uh, 9,364.1257, megawatt hours or something like that, right? Um, this is indicating that you actually know uh, the, the, the accuracy of, of a number down to what the, the tens of tens of watts, right? Um, and, and so, yeah, please make sure to when reporting answers to, um, include them as significant digits so that you're also reporting sort of the level of precision and accuracy uh, in, in your numbers. And 
um, I guess for for those who who don't know, it's it's basically the way that you figure out the number of significant digits is based on um, your input parameters in any equation. The number with the least number of sig figs um, is the number of digits that you'll end up reporting in the final um, in the final answer. Uh, okay. And so, you know, this is just a, a common example, like people often report these regression tables with these um, really long coefficients. Um, but it's important to remember, again, um, that the actual translation uh, should look something more like, like this. Okay, so I, I didn't mark anyone off for that, but in future homeworks, I will be uh, sort of trying to take that into account. So make sure to, to do this. Any questions before we move on to the lecture? All right. So today we'll be talking about fuel and energy supply for infrastructure modeling. Um, so these are considerations and sort of an overview of the landscape of uh, infrastructure um, that you need to think about when you do any sorts of modeling that, that links um, supply side issues. Uh, before we get there though, uh, I did want to go back and cover um, technology stock turnover from our last lecture, which we didn't have enough time to cover. Um, so let's go over that now. Um, and so this all ties into the topic of adoption and diffusion of new technologies, uh, because if you want to think about the stock of the actual technology, what, what we had talked about was um, how new technologies tend to penetrate into, um, it, into society. Uh, and, and we think about you know, how many people who essentially don't have the technology yet, how long it takes them to uh, adopt it. But these things have turnover time. So if you think about uh, uh, vehicles, for example, um, a car might last anywhere between 10 to 15 years. Um, and so as you adopt more of a new technology, say like an electric car, um, it takes time for the original stock to uh, build up, even, even if you're at say 100% electric vehicle sales, um, the, the stock of vehicles in the existing fleet may take uh, another sort of 10, 15 years before everyone has that new technology. Um, and so this uh, stock turnover model is meant to figure out kind of the replacement of your existing technology with, with the new technology instead of just thinking about how fast the new technology is coming in. Um, okay, so the basic concept is fairly simple. Uh, you have some stock of a technology in a given year. Um, and what, what is in that stock is what was in the last period minus what you got rid of plus what you gained. So scraps and, and sales. So scrap being the stuff that gets uh, taken out of the stock and sales being things that, that get added into it. Um, and so that's a sort of fairly generic equation um, that can be used to represent uh, this turnover. Um, and then similar to um, a lot of the diffusion and ad adoption models where they have these sort of shapes, um, there are a couple simple examples of these um, turnover models that have been uh, specific, specifically developed um, to follow some kind of shape. 
Um, so in, in this example, um, you have what's known as a survival rate. So this is the survival rate. Um, and so it, it's basically exactly what it sounds like. It, it tells you uh, how long a particular um, technology is going to last in, in the stock. Um, there is uh, an exponential decay function um, that is um, that that is a function of its half life. So, how long it takes for half of the, that technology to to go away, um, its age, and then some constant factor that tells you essentially how fast uh, that that rate decreases. Um, and so similar to some of the diffusion curves, you can calibrate these parameters to data, uh, to, to real data. And so let's take a look at that. Um, this is a survival curve of passenger cars um, based on vehicle age. Uh, and so the, the way that we read this is that we say, OK, if I look at any particular year, let's say we'll go to year five. Um, in year five, 90% uh, of cars are still going to be on the road. So about 10% of them will have uh, retired um, by, by that age, which, which actually is maybe a little bit bigger than you thought, but uh, vehicles will um rotate out of uh out of the fleet for for a lot of reasons um a lot of times you have high sort of accident rates among newer cars uh that sort of thing uh and then by um by year 20 <coughs> cars um cars that are 20 years old only about 10 percent of them will have been left in in the fleet um, and so this is based on data from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Uh, and you can use this essentially to calibrate the parameters of your survival curve. And this type of survival curve has, um, is fairly constant, but there can be some uh, changes to survivability over time. Um, so for example, uh, as cars get more expensive, um, you can actually see survivability sort of increasing because people tend to uh, hold on to their cars for a little bit longer rather than um, going to uh, sell them and, and buy a new car. Uh, so this kind of trend uh, can change over time, but generally it's fairly stable. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to talk really quickly about um, a pretty well-known model that employs uh, a sort of more detailed um, version of a stock turnover model. Um, called the vision model. It's developed by Argonne National Lab, which is part of the Department of Energy. So it's one of the um, major national labs in the United States. It's a um, spreadsheet-based stock turnover model. Um, and it is open source, so you can go and search for it and um, play around with it if, it's, uh, if, if this topic is at all interesting to you. Um, so from the stock turnover, it's able to calculate a whole bunch of other um, system level impacts. So things like energy and emissions, uh, it can look at different uh, impacts of alternative fuel vehicle adoption. Um, and, and so you specify shares of vehicle technologies. Um, and then it takes into account a whole bunch of these inputs here. 
and it puts it through the vision turno stock turnover model, and then it gives you the uh, outputs and of of impacts of what you think is going to happen based off of um, the the shares and, and things like how much they travel. So to give you a, a sense of, of sort of what this looks like, um, if you provide information on uh, penetration, so let's say if you have a new vehicle technology that you want to see um, and, and see how fast it's sort of, um, uh, and, and you put in how fast the technology gets adopted and then the fuel efficiency of that technology um, you can see uh, how they get um, implemented. This is the survival curve. Um, and then from, uh, from these shares, it'll end up doing a bunch of other calculations um, for uh, impacts associated with uh, the, that specific sort of vehicle technology. Um, one sort of nice way you can see how stock changes based on the age of technology. Um, this is kind of similar to um, uh, the adoption and diffusion curves, right? But it's actually going back and looking at the cumulative amount. And so if you were just to draw a curve that goes uh, along the top of all of these bars, that would essentially be your adoption and diffusion curve. So this would be, this would be your, let me see if I can draw it. So this would be your S-shape adoption curve. But with the um, stock turnover model, you get a whole bunch of information about you know how um, how old each of the sort of technologies are. So if I were to look at uh, the vehicle age zero, so that's going to be sort of your first bar along here. So this is um, how many new cars are being sold in in each year. Um, so so that would all that would be your annual one. So if I were to draw a different line um, like this, that would be your annual adoption curve. Um, and then you can see uh, as you go from year to year, how many of the sort of old cars uh, or cars in any one particular year that gets sold, uh, how big of a proportion they are in the sort of cumulative amounts. And the nice thing about this sort of stock changes, it also will take into account um, like retirement. And so you can see if you, if you track sort of one sort of vintage of a uh, vehicle over time, it will actually start to get smaller as those vehicles um, retire. Um, okay, and so there's actually another version of this um, called the California Vision Model. Um, and so this was adapted by the Air Resources Board to specifically model California vehicles. And so they use this to look at a bunch of different scenarios about vehicle penetration. And it's actually something that a lot of um, researchers uh, in, in Davis have used in the past to look at different pathways of, of uh, vehicle technologies getting adopted. Um, one of the nice things about this is it has a lot of detail in things like the fuel pathway assumption. So you can actually look at, um, hey, where is this hydrogen coming from? Where is this electricity coming from? If I'm modeling you know, hydrogen vehicles or electric vehicles, it has a lot of spatial detail. Um, and there's a lot of other sort of 
customizable elements within within the vision model. Um, and so this is one of these nice sort of high level models that you can play around with a lot of the parameters and settings so that if you wanted to look at a particular scenario, you could do it um, in, in this sort of integrated manner um, that's consistent with looking at a whole bunch of uh, other sort of um, scenarios. And you can look at uh, economic impacts, you can look at emission impacts. Uh, and, and this is kind of important for um, being able to spell out, you know, the, the trajectory of impacts that might come from a particular piece of legislation or, or regulation. And so it's been a pretty handy tool um, to look at uh, scenario analyses. Okay. So that is our sort of final piece of the adoption and technology diffusion lecture. Um, yeah, just let me know if you have any questions. Uh, you can type them in the chat. Um, okay, and otherwise, let's go ahead and move on to the main topic of today. Um, which is to think about infrastructure. Um, so we'll be thinking about um, different approaches and methods for modeling studies of um, uh, fueling infrastructure for transportation. Um, and we'll also think about how these things can be represented in more integrated energy models. Um, so we'll think about what sort of infrastructure there are, um, and we'll look at the existing systems um, as well as infrastructure for alternative fuels. Uh, and the main ones that we'll be covering are going to be biofuels, hydrogen, and electricity. But if there are other sort of supply chains that folks are interested in with respect to the infrastructure, I'll, I'd be happy to, to chat about that as well. Um, so this is a pretty important part of the system that oftentimes gets uh, overlooked or, or fairly sort of simplified. You know, we think a lot about, uh, you know, fuel extraction and, and refining and, and we think about, you know, the impacts of the fuel use, uh, but infrastructure can be a critical piece of that, that system. And so, thinking about, okay, how do I get it from its original resource supply all the way to, let's say, kind of a, an end use station, right? And so this, it, you'll usually have to go through phases of production or conversion and, and transport. And so um, the fueling infrastructure uh, thinks about that entire sort of um, supply chain uh, up to the point where you essentially use the fuel or, or uh, take the fuel for your own vehicle. Um, there are lots of boundary issues for infrastructure. Um, so a lot of studies don't include um, the sort of uh, resource supply end. So usually starting in, in sort of stage two. Um, and that's particularly true of uh, like fossil fuels. Um, however, biomass and biofuel infrastructure oftentimes does include resource supply um, because the, the sort of collection and, and, um, and harvesting um, is such an important point uh, part of the underlying analysis. Um, the sort of difficulty of doing this is, is now when you're comparing with fossil fuels, uh, you may not be sort of thinking about the same sort of boundaries. So it's important to, to carefully consider what you are thinking about as inclusive into your infrastructure system. Um, okay. So fueling infrastructure is um, 
has a, has a couple sort of important criteria to consider. It needs to provide an adequate supply of fuel at competitive cost. It has to be reliable and robust to disruptions. Um, and then you can also have designs of infrastructure that adhere to specific goals like minimizing environmental costs or minimizing uh, security risks. Um, fueling infrastructure uh, is oftentimes a really capital intensive system, which means it requires a lot of investments um, because the assets in, in these can last just as long as um, uh, or, or if, if not longer than sort of the end use or um, other inter intermediate steps. Um, so current systems, um, especially for fossil fuels include uh, oil exploration and extraction, tankers and pipelines, oil refineries, natural gas pipelines, refueling stations. Um, these are fairly complex networks rather than sort of single chains where everything uh, goes from point A to point B to point C. Oftentimes you have lots of interconnections between different, um, different points of your infrastructure. Um, high costs lead to uh, a desire to utilize your infrastructure um, and you want to minimize stranded investments. So for example, drop in biofuels that are compatible with existing petroleum products. So, so we, we, we think about um, a lot of this long lasting infrastructure as, um, as infrastructure that can be uh, robust to even different technologies. Um, and, and I'll give just one quick example. Uh, we have a huge network of natural gas pipelines um, in, in California. You know, this is part of our fueling infrastructure for, especially for electricity generation and for um, end use natural gas supply. Um, and a, a lot of a lot of people are thinking about as we transition to like a hydrogen economy, can we still leverage some of this infrastructure? And, and so there's a lot of studies about how you could convert like a natural gas pipeline into a pipeline that could also transport uh, hydrogen. And, and it's difficult and expensive, um, but it would be cheaper than constructing an entirely new uh, hydrogen pipeline. And so, um, there are lots of these types of opportunities where um, these fueling infrastructure, you want to try and make them as flexible as possible um, so, that, so that you don't end up with um, these stranded investments that are only compatible with sort of one technology. Um, and, and, you know, there aren't, I would say, huge number of examples that, that are quite like that. Um, but, but where they are, I think uh, people do try and keep the opportunity and flexibility um, uh, as, as much as possible. Um, okay. So when we think about our current transportation fuel uh, picture, um, uh, or transport of fuel, not transportation fuel, um, you've got your uh, fuel, your transformation, and your end use. And so uh, you've got coal, natural gas, and then sort of the way uh, that it's worked and, and, um, and how that sort of translates into uh, transport. You can see the vast majority of um, the transportation sector is coming from oil products. There is a little bit of direct consumption from electricity, from natural gas, and from coal, but these are really quite, um, quite a small, small amount. When we think about, you know, how this might change uh, in the future, um, 
this is one particular scenario. Um, according to the International Energy Agency, they have a two degree scenario. Uh, and, and so this uh, figure has changed a little bit where now you, you're starting to get a more substantial amount from electricity and a very large amount from biofuels. And then there's a tiny sliver here at the bottom, which is in orange, which is, which is hydrogen. Um, I would say that this picture is, is actually probably a little bit pessimistic these days. There, there are, I think, as the years have gone by, a lot of scenarios that are a lot more uh, bullish on electricity. And so that, that portion will, will increase quite a bit. Uh, and so as we transition to these types of futures, um, it's not just about getting the supply of that fuel available. It's also, you know, how do we develop the infrastructure, the fueling infrastructure um, to support uh, such a huge transition away from oil products into these other sort of sectors. Okay, so let's talk about what there is um, today in the United States. Um, so you've got about 160,000 service stations. So these are basically your, your gas stations, right? Um, and your average station sees about 1,500 vehicles per, um, or, or services about 1,500 vehicles. Um, and that can vary quite a bit depending on, on location in certain stations, they're gonna be a lot higher in, in certain stations, they're gonna be a lot lower. Uh, there's also um, approximately 5,000 truck stops, so substantially fewer, but these sort of larger depots are um, quite a bit more substantial in the vehicles that they're servicing and the amount of uh, fuel that they're providing. Um, so 380 million gallons of gasoline per day. That's a very large amount of, uh, of fuel and 140 million gallons of diesel per day. Um, most stations are branded, um, so 97%. So they're, they're licensed, but they're actually owned by uh, small businesses. Um, and one of the interesting things is that most of the gas station profit is, is not on the fuel, um, but on sort of other, other items. Uh, and so I sort of talk about this because um, the, as you transition to other sorts of fueling infrastructure, it's important to consider kind of business models and, and economics to think about how um, they might be successful. Uh, and so when we think about moving to, for example, uh, a world where you're mainly doing charging stations or you're doing hydrogen refueling stations, like how are they similar? How can they take advantage of, um, uh, of the structure of the way re uh, refueling happens that, that uh, may be better or worse for, for the businesses? Um, in terms of stations over time, uh, so the main one to, to think about is, um, so your registered vehicles are in the blue um, and your gasoline consumed is in um, this sort of dotted, dotted red. Um, and one of the interesting things to note is that uh, there are, a lot of sort of innovations that have happened in, in the way that we do uh, refueling, which actually led to um, a divergence in the trends of number of stations versus the number of vehicles. And so even though uh, this has gone up substantially, you can actually see um, the, the number of stations, which, which they have a couple different um, uh, metrics for the, in, in the green um, stations that are included in, in the census. Uh, in the purple, there are other stations, uh, total number of outlets in, in the blue. But the main point is that where you see 
increase in gasoline consumption and increasing number of vehicles. Um, there's actually a decrease in, in the number of stations uh, over time since the 1970s. Um, and that's because of technological innovations um, and the fueling infrastructure that basically lets you um, pump out your fuel faster um, and more efficiently, uh, which means that you can service more vehicles per sort of station. So older infrastructure, um, these are a couple sort of examples, right? So, you know, these uh, antiquated pumps, uh, and then you could see in some of these older service stations, you'd have uh, a huge mass of vehicles sort of going around um, a, um, a small number of dispensers, right? And so one of the ways that you can improve the um, throughput of your station is by increasing the, the number of dispensers. Um, and, and now it's really common to see, right? If you go to a gas station, upwards of <clears throat> a, a dozen, fueling dispensers, whereas in um, older fueling stations, that's, uh, that's not the case. Um, yeah, you can see here types of, uh, of pumps and, and station setup. So a lot of drive-in stations and service stations where you'd have other people sort of pumping the fuel for you. And, and now it's sort of mainly uh, self-service, right? It's a, it's a fairly big difference. Um, you can see uh, a, a lot of efficiency as well. Um, in, in the old days, you you get these spills and you'd lose a lot, a lot of fuel. And actually, you know, that still happens, but, but to a much, much smaller extent um, than, than before. So alternative fuel infrastructure. So this, uh, when we think about uh, fueling infrastructure, it sort of co-evolves with vehicle demand. Um, so cost, environmental attributes and convenience uh, are all going to influence um, vehicle demand. Um, there are a lot of challenges with building a new supply and delivery infrastructure. Um, you're competing with this really well-established uh, in, incumbent technology uh, because this sort of infrastructure is highly capital intensive. Um, you, you end up having uh, to face the problem where there's really um, sort of low demand. And so you also have uh, low volume for your fuel supply, which means that you don't get to take advantage of things like uh, economies of scale. Um, and so that's definitely the case right now with something like hydrogen, um, where, uh, where there are not so many vehicles. And as a result, um, the stations themselves are quite expensive. Um, and the, the, the fuel, economics don't work very well for these stations. And so without some sort of uh, mandate requirements or subsidy, um, you're not gonna see many of those stations being developed to satisfy demand that, that doesn't really exist yet. So it's kind of this chicken and egg problem. Um, do I build my infrastructure first or do I get the vehicles out first? And, and in, in reality, you really need sort of both of them to roll out Kind of simultaneously to make sure that um, you are efficiently using the, the fueling infrastructure. Uh, there are also other challenges in, in this transition period. So if I'm like a gas station owner and I want to get into alternative fuel uh, or supporting alternative fuel technologies, okay, am I also going to build a charger there? Am I going to install um, a hydrogen uh, pump there as well, right? And so there are additional challenges in, in, in thinking about multiple different types of fuel technologies. Um, 
consumer convenience and expectations. And so we're, when it comes to gasoline, right, drivers are really spoiled for choice. I can basically get off of any exit on the freeway and there's going to be, voila, a nice sort of gas station just waiting for me. Um, and so that sort of expectation, like you're not going to be able to uh, have that same level of service right away. And so that can detract from people wanting to adopt that technology. Um, and, and so I, uh, I may have talked about this before, but um, uh, Dan Sperling, right, the head of our, uh, of the uh, ITS, um, he had uh, a hydrogen vehicle and he had to drive all the way out to West Sac to, to fill it up. Otherwise you'd have to go all the way into the Bay Area, right? Um, and, and so there are some serious issues of convenience uh, associated with that. Um, and then for folks who own an electric vehicle, right, you may have the same expectation that, hey, I, I wanna be able to fill up my car like a, a gas car, which takes you know a couple minutes um, tops to refuel, whereas it could take many hours to refuel an electric vehicle. Um, and so these are all factors that are gonna push back against um, acceptance of, of this new fueling infrastructure. Um, yeah, and there are also perceptions about risk and risk and safety, you know, you're now having to think about these uh, high voltage lines, are you thinking about this, you know, um, hydrogen fuel under extremely high pressure, you know, it's one, it's probably the most flammable um, uh, compound that, that exists. Uh, today and and so there are lots of um perceptions about risk and safety and then there are you know actual um like engineering considerations about risk and safety that are important um to consider when when uh building this fueling infrastructure um okay so biofuels Let's start with uh, this fuel first. Um, it is actually, when we think about alternative fuel vehicles, so hydrogen and electricity, um, ethanol is actually by far the most widely used alternative fuel. Um, in the United States, uh, in 2014, there were 13.1 billion gallons uh, used and that's uh, relative to about 134 billion gallons of gasoline. And we'll actually talk a little bit what, uh, we'll talk in another lecture about why this is so prevalent. Um, but the basic idea is that uh, you're gonna have um, some proportion of all gasoline, it's gonna have some amount of, of ethanol in it. Um, there are some issues with the way with existing um, engines in being able to use um, higher blends of ethanol, which is why you typically don't see higher than say about 15%. So that's um, E15 in blends of gasoline today, unless you're driving a special type of vehicle. Um, ethanol also has a lower energy content. So you need about a one and a half gallons of ethanol to be the same um, energy as one gallon of gasoline. Um, biodiesel is also very common. Uh, in 2013, uh, we produced 1.3 billion gallons and this is mainly from animal fats and from plant oils. Um, The first generation versus second generation fuels. So this has to do with the um, the the way that these biofuels are produced, and, and that's an issue that we'll we'll explore later. But just know that you know one type of biofuel is uh, and, and ethanol uh, can be 
produced in, in many sort of different ways. And that's an important consideration for environmental reasons and sustainability reasons. And then uh, the idea of the drop-in fuel, um, because it can act as a substitute for gasoline, I think that's probably one of the biggest reasons why the fuel has been uh, so successful or quote unquote successful um, in, in sort of penetrating our existing fuel mix. So one of the things that, that folks are probably less, maybe a little bit less aware of is um, the use uh, and adoption of flex fuel vehicles, which is essentially an alternative fuel vehicle um, in the United States. And there are actually a lot more flex fuel vehicles than there are uh, hydrogen and even electric vehicles in the country. Um, and these are just gasoline vehicles that have been slightly modified um, that it, so that they can take higher blends of, of ethanol. And, and actually the modifications are um, fairly benign. You basically have to add these O-rings so that the, um, to some of the, to the valves so that the ethanol doesn't uh, dissolve them. Um, and, and the cost to an automaker to do this modification is probably a couple hundred bucks a, a, a car. And so oftentimes they'll just stamp on uh, these these like partial zero emission vehicle labels or these you know these like green leaf labels you might have you might have seen on some some gas cars that that really is just an indication that it's a flex fuel vehicle um, and one of the issues with with um, with the way that these were rolled out, and, and again, this is something that we'll we'll talk a little bit more later, uh, is that they, even though they are capable of operating on E85, the vast majority of these vehicles um, simply drive on on gasoline. There's only about 2,700 stations that offer E85 in the country, um, but most of them are going to be located in the Midwest, where a lot of the ethanol is produced. Um, and in terms of amounts, uh, about 137 million uh, gallons of gasoline equivalents of E85 was consumed um, a, a decade ago, which is um, you know less than 0.1 percent of of all the fuel um, for for these passenger vehicles. So still. Um, Still a long way to go here, even though uh, you know 10% of the vehicles, a little less than 10% of the vehicles are uh, flex fuel vehicles in the United States. Um, from fuel prices, uh, how do customers choose between gasoline and E85? So when we think about it on an energy equivalent basis, um, these vehicles or, or this fuel is actually much, uh, or not much, but slightly more expensive than gasoline. So even from an economic perspective, it's, it doesn't make a huge amount of sense to, um, uh, to go for ethanol. Okay, uh, for biofuels production, um, most biofuels today are made from starch and oil, um, cellulosic based fuels, which we consider to be more um, sustainable and environmentally friendly um, are kind of the long-term goals, but there are a lot of um, engineering and technological hurdles that have to be overcome before um, we can sort of economically vi and viably uh, use those types of fuels. Um, one of the probably nice, probably the nicest thing about biofuels with regard to the fueling infrastructure is that 
we can potentially use existing fueling systems to, 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 um, to do that. And so when we think about like the large scale gasoline storage um, or an, an underground storage, even those that are located at the fueling stations themselves, um, there really isn't a big problem with changing from gasoline to say um, E85, uh, as, a, as opposed to um, other types of fuels. Like you definitely wouldn't be able to do that with hydrogen or natural gas. And, and obviously the infrastructure is, is quite different for um, electric vehicles. Um, okay, let's, uh, we're an hour in, so why don't we take a break before we go on to other uh, fuel technologies and, and infrastructure. Um, quick question. So on the, um, for the cafe credits, uh, mm -hmm. before 2016, that's, that's for, uh, flex fuel vehicles. They were just assuming that 50% of all flex fuel vehicles were, were hitting that E85. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it, it, it definitely gets a little bit complicated, but the, but the way that the credits work in cafe is um right spread through the entire fleet of vehicles that the the, the producer makes right and so they yeah, just that's right. they're just trying to hit a specific point in balance where they're like oh well you know we we make these you know zero emissions vehicles over here maybe we don't sell very many of them but it balances out our suvs yeah um but there are like some more complex like incentive mechanisms and one of those is like uh they were basically saying okay how do we get automakers to make um, alternative fuel vehicles, like flex fuel vehicles, like electric vehicles, um, and, and like hydrogen vehicles? Um, and then you also have to think about how much they, um, they emit, right? As, as part of the cafe is, is, is um, is tied in with uh, EPA regulation for greenhouse gas emissions. So they basically were saying, uh, or the incentives work in such a way that like, if you are using an alternative fuel, we're gonna give you some, some extra like credits essentially. Uh, and right. and we'll, we'll actually talk about this in more detail at, at some point, but uh, the whole idea uh, there though is is that you have to be able to track uh, or estimate like on average how much of the fuel gets used for like dual fuel vehicles so like it, if if i sold like a chevy volt right which can go on both gas and electricity like how do you how do you count it right um, and so they came up with these round numbers for a lot of these uh, vehicles. And um, for flex fuel vehicles, they just said half. Uh, yeah. Even though, right, from the data, we know that like less than 1% use E85. Right, I mean, the number of times that I've actually seen an E85 pump, and I've, I mean, I think I've driven across the country like 20, 20 different times in my life. And like yeah. the number of times that I've stopped somewhere and there's been an E85 pump, I could definitely count on one hand, like yeah. easily. I think I've only, the only one that I knew of was uh, E85 station in Pittsburgh. Um, yeah. I think that's- the Yeah, and all in that, that same region, all in that, sa it's that same region, like you said. And, yeah. and uh, and not even at the main like flying J stops or anything either, just only when you like went to like the more like smaller gas stations off the highway. That's yeah, yeah. Some of them can can definitely be out of the way for sure. Yeah. Anyway, interesting. It's very, uh, yeah. Just uh, those big round numbers that just get pulled out of space and they're like 50%. Yeah, yeah, 50%. That's a nice round number. <laughs> That's easy to quantify. Let's just throw yeah. that on there. And 
that makes our math easier and uh, gives us more credits. Roll with yeah. it. Um, <laughs> the the uh, the corn lobby uh, has a strong influence, even even in transportation. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You just yeah, they have they have a great market uh, presence with their you know just to show the sad farmer you know yeah kicking up a dirt in a dusty field like i don't know if i could stay financially viable with my family's hundred year old farm unless you buy all our ethanol yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh all right so let's uh we're at 305 so why don't we continue on Um, okay, so the next set of infrastructure that we'll talk about is for electric vehicles. Um, so EV infrastructure, uh, we've talked a little bit about this already. Um, you, you've got your different charge levels, although actually it shouldn't even be level three, this should be DC fast charging. Um, yeah, so you've got different technical specifications um, and these outlets get tell you sort of the, um, uh, the rate at which it can recharge. So in, in miles, you're getting about six miles per hour of charging, which is 10 to 60 um, in your level two. And then for DC fast charging, uh, you're gonna be getting um, 100 to 400 miles per, uh, per hour of charging and, and even even faster now. The, this number can be sort of, uh, we already actually have existing stations that go up to 350, which is like a full charge in something on the order of five to 10 minutes. Um, and the expectation is that home charging provides the bulk of EV charging um, with workplace and public charging providing a small amount, amount, amount of miles. And, and we now know that this to be fairly true, um, about 85% uh, in terms of energy is um, charged at, at home with the remainder being in public infrastructure or at, at the workplace. Um, and there is actually a nice paper out of a couple of researchers from, from Davis that has a, a pretty sort of nice breakdown um, of, of each of those proportions. Uh, from real data. Um, and so your traditional fueling infrastructure might look something like this, where you have travel demand and all of that is being satisfied at public stations. Whereas for your electric vehicle fueling infrastructure, um, you know, you've got a whole bunch into home charging and some into public and some in, into um, workplace charging. And the allocation, right, of how much uh, I charge in any particular location depends on the pricing, right? And so when I think about home charging, you are talking about the electricity rates that you pay to your utility, right, against that, that amount of energy. Um, you might have to pay like membership access if you are doing a public station. Uh, so, so for example, uh, EVgo, one of the larger um, charging service providers, uh, you can opt into like a $10 a month um, uh, membership and they give you some discounts on, on uh, charging at their stations, right? And you have to sort of balance that against what you would be paying and how often you go there. And of course, personal preference, um, you know, do I wanna be going out of my way to go travel to these stations to be, to be charging or, you know, do I need it for a particular uh, trip, that sort of thing. And so all of these are going to factor into the decision-making process of, of where to charge. Uh, and then the um, 
ratio of, of these things can affect lots of different sort of outcomes. And so if I do, you know, lots of uh, workplace charging or public charging versus home charging, right, it can, uh, it can change the, the costs, it can change um, emissions associated with that. And, and when I say costs, I mean, even costs of deploying the station, right, because if you have uh, a whole ton of investment into public stations, you're getting economies of scale and, and those sort of benefits. Um, this, this is a nice uh, chart showing um, the, the potential uh, at different times of the day for fueling infrastructure. Um, and so this is with a sort of relatively smaller sample of, of vehicles. This is um, back, back in uh, 2009, actually before there were very many electric vehicles at all. Um, they were actually able to do uh, interviews and, and surveys of um, electric vehicle owners. And you can see here, uh, in the black, these are the times that um, drivers are uh, actually driving the vehicle um, versus uh, in the shaded regions, what time of the day that they are uh, charging. Um, and so this is kind of a nice little baseline graph to think about when, um, when you're considering a fueling infrastructure for something that can take uh, a longer sort of period of time. And so as opposed to like a gas car where I can just drive into a station, refuel in a couple minutes and then, and then leave, you know, that option is, um, I don't wanna say not available, but like less available for, for EVs today. Um, and, and this can help inform a lot about how we design and, and think about the rollout of fueling infrastructure. Um, and so these, these types of considerations are really important to consider um, as you think about these technology transitions. Um, so this is a nice little part about charging behavior of commuters with um, uh, plug-in electric vehicles. So again, home is the most popular charging location, um, but there's a significant share of uh, workplace and multi-location charging. Um, so this is a distribution of uh, charging location choices um, from these commuters. Um, there, there are actually, this is, this chart itself is, is actually a, a little bit older. And so there were some, uh, there were actually some owners with dual fuel vehicles who weren't charging at all. Uh, and they would just drive the vehicles on, on gasoline. And that was reflected in, in some of the, um, in, in some of the data, which is pretty interesting. Um, so some of the challenges, uh, availability of home recharging. So this is actually a really hot topic um, even today. Uh, as we think about um, issues related to things like environmental justice and, and equitable access, um, a lot of early adopters of electric vehicles uh, tend to be um, wealthier, uh, wealthier individuals who have, um, you know, these single family households, access to garages where you could um, charge the vehicle from or install, install a charger. Um, and now as we're getting into a lot more of the sort of mainstream population where you're starting to, uh, you're, you're starting to get to populations who live in, uh, MUDs, um, you know, apartment complexes, uh, condos, that sort of thing. 
uh, the availability of um, uh, residential charging becomes a little bit more challenging. And so there are actually a lot of um, efforts in uh, particularly in California to address this. Um, the Public Utilities Commission, for example, um, required a, a bunch of the utilities to provide support to uh, install chargers at MEDs as, as just one example. Um, but in addition to that, um, some people are thinking about uh, dedicated off-street parking um, uh, to, to help address some of these issues, um, like, like the fact that you, you, know, you have almost five times as many cars as there are garages in the United States. Uh, and most of, most of the parking in sort of larger cities tend to be um, non-dedicated uh, parking spots that are um, uh, on the street. And so even if you were to install charters on, on certain, um, in, in certain areas in, in the public, uh, like for overnight charging, there's no guarantee that as a EV owner that you'd be able to have access to that, which is um, which can be a big challenge. Uh, the longer recharging time, which is something we've we've talked a few times about, um, but already that's possibly uh, some some people are thinking about this as as an asset in terms of you know, hey, if we can get customers to stay here longer, you, you know, we can provide them extra services um, and they can spend more money. And so this goes, this kind of harkens back to the idea at the gas station where most of the profits are from selling, you know, snacks and, and drinks, um, similar type of thing here. Uh, there are already um, places where they have set up like cafes where you can, uh, charge, uh, you can charge your vehicle and spend some time at, um, and basically providing these like local services. So, so that's, uh, um, the idea of, of having to stay there for a lengthy period of time is it can actually be a sort of benefit for, for the driver and for local businesses. Um, there have been some ideas about, um, options to, uh, to help mitigate the, the recharging time issue. And so these include um, battery swapping. So if the batteries and vehicles can be standardized, I could just drive the vehicle in, uh, pull out the battery and put in a fully charged one and you just swap it out. And then the other battery can just be uh, charged up uh, at, at another time. Um, and so this was a popular idea uh, many years ago. I think that, that a bunch of studies have looked into this and it basically doesn't end up being economically viable at all. So there is some kind of uh, implementation issue that the automakers would have to like standardize their batteries, which is um, already one sort of big challenge. But uh, it turns out that the economics of holding a bunch of batteries um, and then how much you would charge people for them, it, it never really ends up working. Uh, you can never get the scale right to make your money back for battery swapping stations. Uh, and then the other one is inductive roadways so that, you know, if I'm just driving over the road, I can actually be wires, wirelessly recharging the vehicle. Um, that sounds pretty nice in theory, uh, but is uh, also sort of uh, dead on arrival in terms of, of economics. The cost of building these roadways and maintaining them um, is, um, is cost prohibitive, uh, essentially. Okay, so then thinking about what sort of factors affect the use of charging infrastructure throughout the day. Um, it's a sort of uh, fairly complex network of um, uh, decisions and considerations. Um, and so 
It depends on the driver. It depends on the type of trip that you're making, right? And so, uh, for example, if I'm just commuting to work, um, it's probably not such a big idea a big deal to to require you know this public infrastructure but if i'm driving out to tahoe or going to um you know driving down to southern california then the charging infrastructure requirement for that is going to be really different um the access to chargers and so um there there's a pretty sort of interesting um uh, conflict in in charging infrastructure uh, usage. So, as as a service provider, you actually you want to have your charger being used all the time. You want high utilization, um, right? Because then you're able to sell that electricity and make your money back on building that station. Um, but as a driver you want the opposite because if the charger is being utilized all the time, it means that there's gonna be congestion at the charger. You have to wait for other people to use them. Uh, and, and so this, this is a phenomenon that, um, that we have observed in reality where um, chargers that are highly utilized are um, considered to be sort of the least reliable chargers by uh, re regular drivers. And so if I really need to rely on a charger, I'm not gonna go to the one that's the busiest um, and that has, has the most vehicles. Um, and so here you have like sort of uh, this direct conflict uh, of interest between wanting high utilization on the business side and wanting low utilization on the driver side. Um, the cost of charging in alternative locations. So as I was mentioning before, right? If, uh, if you are paying a lot more at, uh, at home versus in the public versus in the workplace, that's also going to be an important driver for um, how you decide which, which location to charge at. Uh, the vehicle technology and range is, can actually be a really big uh, factor as well. And so one of the things that, that uh, one of the interesting things that we find is that um, if you drive like a low range vehicle, um, you actually end up needing to uh, charge the vehicle a lot more versus if you have like a 300 mile vehicle, you, uh, you don't bother because you can make lots of your daily commute trips or shorter trips. Um, uh, you can make a lot of those trips before needing to fill up your vehicle again. And so you might, uh, you might charge your vehicle, you know, once every couple days, once every week, as opposed to charging it every day. Uh, and that can make a, a difference in deciding where and when to, to charge. Uh, and then, yeah, so the convenience we, we talked about. Uh, and then note that this too can be really different for a battery electric vehicle versus a plug-in hybrid. And so being able to have the, the gas alternative can, can mean like if, okay, if I wanna do like a really long distance trip, if I wanna drive down to Southern California, for example, uh, as a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, I won't need the charging station. I can just do it on gas. But uh, if it's fully battery, then you definitely would need some chargers uh, in between um, in between locations. Um, okay, so costs. So focusing on uh, thinking about the cost per mile. Um, so if you drive sort of an average gas car, um, that is. Uh, so, so like a uh, 30 mile per gallon vehicle at a gas price of $3 per gallon, that's going to cost you about 10 cents per mile um, on the fuel. Um, and then if you were to do uh, 12 cents per kilowatt hour, which, which is actually kind of cheap 
um, that that's kind of like a like a tier one rate, maybe lower than tier one rate actually, um, at 0.3 kilowatt hours per mile, which is a fairly sort of average efficiency for an electric vehicle. You're on the order of of three three cents per mile, um, but that 12 cents per kilowatt hour is just um, for generation and distribution, right? That's that's the, the, the cost of the electricity, but you also have to think about um, infrastructure uh, equipment costs. So at home, you know, if it's a level one, uh, that's just plugging into your standard outlet. So no equipment really needed, but it's limited to a lower power uh, rate of charging. Um, and I'm not even gonna say no equipment, you actually need the, the J1772 connector, which is um, if you sort of bought that, sort of just like a stock model, it'd, it'd be about a hundred bucks. Uh, for level two, um, the equipment cost itself might be um, a couple hundred dollars, so 400 to $700. Uh, but then you also have to pay an electrician to install it and um, for permitting and possibly even upgrading your, um, your circuit. Um, and, and so that can, that can cost uh, sort of on the order of $1,000 total. Um, these days, a lot of those costs are subsidized by the utility and, and by the government. And so you get a lot of these benefits um, for, for a lot cheaper. And, and you can see uh, without those subsidies, you might, it might look something, the total cost might look something like this. So on the order of 1200 up to as high as maybe $2,000, depending on each of these uh, component breakdowns. Uh, so level two, um, so this is the, you know, six to seven kilowatt charger. Um, you can see the cost per charger. So that's referring to essentially per dispensing plug. Uh, if I build like a single station versus five stations, you're gonna get these immediate um, economies of, of scale essentially because uh, you know, for example, if I needed to um, build out the like trenching um, and, and that sort of thing, uh, you, you wouldn't need to do that individually for, for every single one. And so, you know, you're going to save on, on labor um, and uh, yeah, it, it's mainly going to be in, in labor and mobilization that, that you're saving. Um, and, the, and you don't need separate permitting, so, so those costs will, will decrease as well. Um, yeah, and so uh, the reason why parking garages uh, install, so you can see these are different scales. So in a parking garage, these things cost um, uh, maybe $5,000, whereas uh, at curbside, it's gonna cost um, significantly more. Um, and, and the main reason for that has to do um, with the installation of the electrical equipment and, and trenching um, for curbside, you you're essentially have to go underground, which means um, uh, lots of like, labor costs associated with um, the, the digging uh, and burying of the equipment, whereas you don't really have any of that with, uh, with parking garages. Um, or, or they get built in at the same time. Uh, yeah, and so level one, thousand dollars, level two, anywhere between five to ten thousand dollars. Um, and then for DC fast chargers, um, this can be uh, a lot more expensive. Um, the hardware itself is uh, extremely expensive. You, you need, uh, because of the power 
the high power and uh, voltage of this equipment, um, oftentimes you need to install um, a special transformer just to be able to handle um, the power output for these. Uh, and, and actually this, I would, I would even go so far as to say that this particular chart is definitely going to be on the low end. Um, we have some projects working with Caltrans where we're looking at installation of these chargers at, um, at rest stops. And, and some of those costs can, are going up into like a million dollar territory. Um, and so it's gonna be quite a bit higher than, than what you're seeing here. This is, this is definitely sort of on, on the low end. Uh, and this is just a little table. Um, I, I won't go into too much details here, but if you want a little bit more information about um, the breakdown of, of, these, uh, of these costs, this is coming from a study out of the um, Rocky Mountain Institute, so RMI. Uh, and their numbers are, I think, fairly good. Um, probably, I would say on the low end for uh, for DC fast charging, but but otherwise pretty good. Okay. Um, so fuel production for electric vehicles. This is a topic that we've touched on already. Um, but if we're thinking about emissions impacts at a given time, it is a market media process. Um, and if you are directly charging or using um, renewable energy credits, it's going to uh, uh, play a role in sort of determining um, what electricity is on the margin to, uh, to be charging your electric vehicle. And you can then figure out the impacts of the vehicle charging on uh, greenhouse gas emissions. And so again, this plays uh, a crucial role with um, with the charging infrastructure, and so when we when when we think about um, charging behavior and maybe uh, trying to shift charging times to uh, to correspond with uh, renewable energy, it's not just about pricing it correctly, and it's not just about getting um, consumers uh, aware of this, you also actually need the chargers in the places where people are during the day, if, if for example, you want them to take advantage of, of solar. Um, and so, you know, some, uh, some folks have, have talked about, you know, shifting, shifting the time of charging is less about pricing people correctly and, and more about just building certain types of chargers. And so if if you have a lot more workplace chargers available, then you're you're naturally going to see uh, a lot more daytime charging happening. Um, and so fueling infrastructure itself can play a really big role in, in some of these impacts. OK, this, uh, this slide is, is sort of saying the, the same thing. Um, okay, and so that's that sort of covers electric vehicles. Um, I basically have one quick slide on natural gas uh, stations. Um, these are uh, really similar in sort of structure and um, and design as uh, gasoline, except that you have um, certain. Uh, uh, certain types of stations um, that have some uh, sort of design differences. Um, so you've got these uh, fast fill stations and, and time fill stations. Um, and these sort of principles are going to overlap actually with uh, hydrogen fueling infrastructure. Uh, the way that these fast fill stations work is that you've got these lines that have um, storage in them uh, or, or these pre-filled storage devices that are compressed at higher pressures. And so you can pretty quickly dispense them, but then it takes some time for 
uh, for those storage devices to get refilled up and, um, and repressurized. Um, where, whereas uh, with these time fill stations, um, they're going to fill up a lot uh, slower, but then because of the utilization of the vehicles, um, you don't necessarily need them to be uh, filling up at, at sort of high rates. Um, and so the difference for the fueling infrastructure is really important to consider based on the end use, if it's like retail customers or if they're fleet vehicles, um, and based on, on sort of how often the refueling needs to happen. Um, okay, and so we'll think about these principles um, as applied to hydrogen technology. Um, hydrogen can be made from all primary energy sources, which is um, a nice sort of feature um, that basically it, that, that can take advantage of you know, electricity, but also other sort of pathways for production. Um, and so the vast, so, so what we, I think what, what we eventually want is the production of hydrogen from electrolysis, uh, which is using electricity to split water into oxygen and hydrogen. Um, this is particularly uh, beneficial if the electricity that you're using is clean. So if it's coming from renewable sources, uh, that means that your hydrogen is uh, production is, is clean as well. But actually these days, the vast majority of hydrogen is coming from steam, uh, uh, steam, steam reformation, which uses um, methane uh, chemical process to produce hydrogen. And, and that is actually, not so clean, unfortunately. Um, and so eventually as we get to sort of higher demand for that fuel in order for it to be clean, it needs to shift away from steam reformation towards uh, uh, electrolysis that is employing renewable uh, energy to, to, to conduct electrolysis. Um, and then there are different um, production pathways. Um, so you can have on-site production versus centralized. Uh, so, so you can think of this as uh, if, if you have like a fueling station, um, the hydrogen would be essentially produced on-site. And so you would have, um, your existing energy infrastructure. So if we were doing electrolysis, this is just um, your electricity to produce uh, the hydrogen uh, basically at the, at the station. Um, the centralized hydrogen production um, is where you have a larger scale facility producing uh, much larger volumes of hydrogen, which means that you're getting things like economies of scale, um, but you, you will then have to transport it from the plant to the end station. And that can be done via um, trailer, as you can see in this picture, um, but also can be uh, done via pipeline. Uh, and so you have to weigh sort of the, the costs and benefits of um, doing that transportation, which you get to avoid with your on-site production uh, compared to, you know, having higher efficiency production and, and cheaper production in a centralized location. And so those are kind of the main, um, main pathways of, of hydrogen fueling infrastructure that, that are thought about today. Um, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail here, but this is basically to show that there are, um, and, and again, this is just a small sort of sample um, of, of different possible designs of, uh, of stations for hydrogen. Um, and this encompasses 
uh, you know, local production, um, uh, as well as uh, centralized production, right, where you're doing these pipelines versus um, uh, producing it um, on site. Uh, there are different types of, of ways that you could do storage for, for hydrogen, uh, whether you're doing it by liquid, um, which means that you have to maintain it at a uh, very low temperature in order to liquefy it um, versus if you are doing um, uh, a compressed hydrogen station, which is, I guess, the rest of these, um, where you're operating them at, at much sort of higher pressure in order to get a, a good volume of it. Uh, and so there are, there are lots of potential uh, hydrogen designs. Um, and because we're kind of in such an early stage of, of deployment, uh, there isn't really any sort of clear winner or, or even necessarily direction in, in terms of what we think is gonna be sort of most successful for uh, fueling, uh, providing hydrogen fuel. Um, in terms of counts of, of hydrogen stations, there are uh, the very small number. Um, this is actually just in California. Um, and so this development, uh, we have, I think in 2020, at the end of 2020, um, I think there were 74 stations in, in California. Uh, and, and again, a lot of this is driven by um, really sort of high subsidies uh, and, and support, from, uh, support from the government. Uh, the, these are not sort of um, really economically viable stations on, on their own, especially considering the fact that uh, the number of hydrogen vehicles in the California fleet is um, numbering uh, in, in sort of very low volume. So on the order of like, I wanna say 10,000-ish uh, uh, hydrogen vehicles. And so, the, so very low demand, especially relative to both electric vehicles and, and gasoline vehicles. So consumer convenience is critical. Um, retail stations is an important barrier to adoption of alternative mm. fuel vehicles. And so availability of these stations, um, yeah, they're just not as many available right now, especially in regards to hydrogen for electric vehicles. I, I think that's actually uh, less true. You actually probably have more you actually have a lot more public infrastructure than there are even gas stations in, in California, which, which surprises some people. Um, early infrastructure will be sparse. And so we, we see that example with, with hydrogen. There's only one station nearby uh, to, to this location. Probably the next one is, is closer to 100 miles away. Um, and so with gas stations, uh, there's so much redundancy uh, that, that uh, you don't necessarily need to get to the same level as gas stations to achieve the sort of same level of, of convenience. And so that's an important thing to, to remember um, is, is that the convenient, like the level of convenience that we have with all these gas stations, um, you can probably replicate that without having the same volume. Um, okay, and so what I wanted to do now uh, was to uh, look at a couple of case studies uh, of, of um, real research that folks have done in uh, looking at infrastructure analysis. And so a lot, a lot of these, uh, items that we talked about um, are, are sort of gonna come into, come into play here. And so the spatial layout, economies of scale, um, convenience issues, uh, transition issues. 
Um, so studies that have looked at consumer convenience and station coverage, um, most of these are gonna be related to hydrogen. Um, and then in sort of in the past, uh, also looking at some other alternative fuels. So way back even in the sort of late eighties, um, if you had a certain sort of level of coverage, uh, you reduce a lot of the concerns about fuel availability. And even though this study was specifically thinking about diesel, a lot of the lessons from this kind of pervade and extend into the way that we think about fuel coverage for other types of fuels. Um, and, and so uh, this is kind of a roadmap to how you might deploy stations um, and, and make sure that uh, a lot of the concerns about fuel availability are mitigated. Um, and, and the way that a lot of these studies work is you look at traffic flows and average driving times uh, to think about how inconvenient it would be to travel to certain areas to, to refuel. Um, and so we actually draw on a lot of these older studies still to, to think about um, rollout for, uh, for new technology fuels. Um, so hydrogen station siting, there was a nice study back in the early 2000s um, by Mike Nicholas, who is an alumni of um, the UC Davis TTP program. Um, and he looked in Sacramento based on commuting trips, uh, where would you need to essentially place uh, stations and how long would it take to, um, to travel to these based on commuting trips uh, and what and how many number of stations uh, would need to be deployed uh, to reduce your travel time. Um, and so you can see here the, the actual deployment um, and then depending on the origin destination, right? How many trips there are, how long it takes uh, to travel to the station. Um, yeah, and so this is a nice little study that looks at convenience of travel relative to um, number of stations uh, getting deployed. Uh, there is another study here um, looking at a way to deal with uh, the sort of chicken and egg problem um, that I was talking about with transitioning. Uh, and to minimize the cost of initial fuel infrastructure. And so one of the things that I was mentioning before is strategically, we really wanna roll out these stations based off of, um, based on the number of vehicles. So you wanna efficiently, you don't wanna to build too much and you don't wanna to build too little. Um, and so this, this is a nice little study that um, basically did these projections and scenario forecasts about uh, how many um, fuel cell vehicles uh, there would be in any particular year. And, and then the associated infrastructure that you'd want to have um, to complement where, uh, where these vehicles would be traveling based off of their uh, adoption location. Uh, and so they have uh, this deployment map of um, these, these surveyed areas and then where it would make the most sense to, to put these, these stations. Um, and, and by doing this in this sort of framework, you can really kind of figure out um, the, not only how many stations, but the type and size of the stations in a cost efficient way that, that really sort of minimizes, um, that, that minimizes uh, any um, underuse, uh, underutilization of, of the stations. Um, 
this is another a, a different study um, by researchers at NREL, another one of the national labs looking at um, inconvenience costs of uh, refueling. So this is a measure uh, of, of essentially the uh, uh, sort of indexed cost uh, of um, how inconvenient it is to have to uh, have to uh, use a station um, for a particular driver. And so they did this across a whole set of different uh, cities. Um, and, and you can see uh, you essentially have this quote unquote penalty um, for uh, for coverage based off of different types of, of trips. Um, and so all of these studies that, that I'm going over are these really sort of nuanced focused studies that look specifically at details um, associated with installation of, of infrastructure um, that, that really have to do with, um, you know, costs and, uh, and, and consumer behavior. Um, but we can also think about uh, the fueling infrastructure as it relates to sort of larger uh, system models. And so this is an example of, of that where, you know, components of, of your energy system also have to include things about uh, fueling infrastructure. And so this is actually a fairly robust one where they show these uh, diagrams where uh, it covers liquid fuel, gaseous fuel, and electricity infrastructure. Um, and so because of how important fueling infrastructure is to thinking about a technology as a whole, like you, you couldn't just uh, not consider like charging stations or hydrogen fueling stations when thinking about electric cars or, or hydrogen cars, because those all add to cost components and insert some kind of model. In some models, they also influence like how likely it is that uh, people will even buy that technology in the first place. Um, and so uh, fueling infrastructure often finds a pretty important role in, in tying in with these larger system models. Um, so when you are doing this sort of modeling, um, there are lots of important considerations to think about. Um, when you, when you are developing, uh, these, you can develop like a really highly detailed spatial, uh, model where you are figuring out the exact locations versus just sort of dealing with, uh, you know, like a stations per vehicle uh, type of model. Um, and, and so they're on these really different ends of the spectrum in terms of, of complexity. Um, are you, are you and, and, and that's gonna really sort of depend on the context of the analysis. Are you going to have it as the sort of standalone infrastructure model? So what we were talking about earlier with, with some of those case studies looking in specific locations, versus are you gonna integrate it into a larger scale system? Uh, what parts of the model are gonna be endogenous versus exogenous? So like, is it gonna actually end up influencing, you know, prices of, of fuels or the way that, that people adopt the vehicles, in which case you've got this like circular thing going on where uh, you wanna build more, which the, leads to more adoption of the technology, which leads to you having to build more infrastructure. So, so, um, or, or, or whether or not you just keep that as like an external assumption, right? And so there's many sort of different approaches to, to doing this. Um, how are you gonna do the demand? Uh, so learning by doing economies of scale, these are things that as you scale up the, um, the, the deployment and sizing of the infrastructure, right? That's going to affect the system in certain ways. You're going to do, get cost reductions, that sort of thing. Um, and then what are you actually interested in looking at uh, as 
as a result of this uh, modeling? Is it, are you just looking at the deployment? Are you looking at downstream and upstream impacts? Um, yeah. So one of the one of the key questions that I haven't talked so much about is economies of scale. Uh, this can be really difficult for infrastructure where you don't have much information about uh, costs, uh, particularly for new technologies. Um, but there are some methods to get some estimates from fewer fewer data points. Um, costs will typically increase right as you go from smaller to larger systems but they're typically not sort of linear with size and that's that's where you're getting this sort of economies of, of scale um, so this is one common equation um, that's uh, that can be used to um, get these nonlinear economies of scale. So the cost at a specific size uh, is equal to your initial um, times the ratio of those sizes times some, um, that goes to some power um, exponent, which, uh, which can be uh, calibrated to real data. So here are some examples of, of alphas where you do achieve some economies of, of scale. Um, and you can, you can try and parameterize this and, and look at sensitivities or develop some scenarios for your alpha if you are um, uh, if you're dealing with a technology where you don't have good cost numbers. Um, some examples of that particular um, economies of scale um, cost curve. Uh, can be seen here. So for an ethanol plant, hydrogen delivery, CO2 pipeline, right? So the number of refueling stations compared to um, the, uh, the distance to your destination and then the cost. And so as you have more and more of these stations, the cost of the delivered hydrogen will sort of decrease, right? Due to economies of scale. Uh, similarly for an ethanol plant, um, and then for your CO2 pipeline, um, right, the sizing is, is increasing, but not in a linear way. Um, yeah, and so like I, like I was saying in determining that, that alpha, you know, it's a pretty important number because it can drive a lot of the, um, decision making of, of the model um, depending on on um, on what value you choose and and so there has been some work to look at uh, different studies and different case studies um, of uh, and asking experts and looking at real data um, of a whole bunch of different uh, hydrogen stations uh, and from this you can derives for rough ranges for what that that alpha might be um, and then you can get some measure of, of economies of scale for these types of, of stations okay um, and then lastly utilization of the refueling equipment um, so this is somewhat related to um, the scale, right? And, and so depending on how much your station gets used, that's going to affect your sort of index um, uh, fuel cost, oh, how much, how much it, the, the fuel is uh, at the end of the day, because you're sort of um, divide, you're, you're including the fueling infrastructure, and then you're dividing over the, the actual number that, that gets dispensed. And so depending on utilization, that can really help sort of drive down the, the fuel costs. And so um, when we think about determining costs for the infrastructure, uh, you also have to know uh, how much it gets used. 
Um, and that, that in itself can be a, a fairly sort of difficult question. Um, and, and oftentimes you'll have to make some kind of assumptions about, about utilization in order to get uh, accurate sort of cost numbers. Um, okay, so I'll, this is kind of the last slide. I'll, I'll sort of end it here um, as to give you a overall sort of um, list uh, of the infrastructure components that you might want to consider in any sort of models that include uh, this infrastructure. And, and, and as I was sort of mentioning before, um, this can be done in, in really sort of simple assumptions or in, in a lot of detail, it really depends on what you're trying to do. Um, and the methodology or approach in, in deriving some of the uh, models can be uh, very different. You can think about it um, in terms of the operational aspects, in terms of spatial and temporal details. Um, yeah, and, and so uh, there, there are a lot of different ways to, to skin the cat for developing these infrastructure models. Um, but, but when you are doing sort of system level models, uh, it's very important to include um, these sorts of, uh, uh, or, or at least to think about a lot of these components. Otherwise you, you could be missing uh, a really important characteristic of, of the technology that could either help, you know, uh, boost it or, or make it totally, um, uh, unviable. Okay, so we will end here for today. Um, I'll stick around just briefly for any uh, questions um, or comments that uh, folks might have.